Uh, I'd like to thank the program committee for the privilege of the podium and the opportunity to present our work on Reboa in the setting of uh, massive abdominal venous hemorrhage. This work was uh, funded by the United States Air Force 711 Human Performance Wing. So non-compressible torso hemorrhage is typically defined with both a physiologic and an anatomic parameter. Physiologically, the hemorrhage has to be severe enough to induce a shock state, which is typically thought of as a systolic blood pressure of less than 90. And anatomically, it's located within the thorax, the abdomen, or the pelvis, and it can't be compressed with external pressure or the application of a tourniquet. The problem with non-compressible tor torso hemorrhage is that it's highly lethal. In civilian trauma patients with otherwise survivable injuries, it accounts for 60 to 70% of mortality, and similar results are seen in the military setting as well. Of the 232 potentially preventable deaths in OIF and OEF up to 2008, 85% were found to be due to blood loss, 69% from a non-compressible source. And the big problem is there's no reliable pre-hospital intervention uh, for non-compressible torso hemorrhage, and it requires an operation or angiography to control. Now, balloon occlusion of the, orta, of the aorta was first described in the 1950s, but didn't become popularized until the 90s with the advancement of endovascular techniques and vascular surgery. To date, it's been evaluated in the setting of trauma, ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysms, GI bleeding, pelvic surgery, particularly oncologic surgery where massive blood loss is anticipated, and in the setting of postpartum hemorrhage. In trauma, it's been evaluated for solid organ injury and arterial injury. However, for major venous bleeding, it hasn't been evaluated. So to that end, we hypothesized that the use of Reboa in the setting of a major abdominal venous injury would lead to improved hemodynamics, decreased blood loss, slower rate of bleeding, and prolonged survival time. To test this, we ran 10 animals through our hemorrhage and ischemia reperfusion model. And at the beginning of the experiment, all animals had the insertion of invasive monitoring devices. So we performed a two-hit model in which we performed our hemorrhage and then performed a second injury and inflated the balloon. So what it looks like is a 35% controlled blood volume hemorrhage, the induction of ischemia via a 45-minute supraceliac aortic cross clamp, the removal of the cross clamp over five minutes to establish reperfusion, a four-hour resuscitation phase in which only fluids and uh, vasopressors were used, the pre-placement of the Reboa catheter, the creation of our injury, 60 seconds of free bleeding, and then 45 minutes of the Reboa with the balloon inflated. The reason we decided not to use blood products was to sort of simulate a prolonged field care setting in which you would have an injury and the development of a shock state, and you could potentially stabilize the patient with Reboa, but you wouldn't have access to definitive care. To create our injury, we went through a five animal model development phase, and what we found is we were able to reliably and reproducibly create massive hemorrhage by removing a five millimeter section of the right common iliac vein. So the Reboa phase was 10 animals, five control and five Reboa. There was no active resuscitation, meaning they were only given fluids and the pressors that they were on at the start of the phase. We pre-positioned the catheter through the left femoral artery in zone one of the aorta, performed our injury, allowed the bleeding, inflated the balloon, and then measured vital signs every five minutes until 45 minutes or a sustained map of 20. At the time of randomization to control a Reboa, all animals demonstrated shock physiology as manifested with hypotension and acidosis. Uh, so you can see the hemodynamic changes in the um, control and the Reboa arm at the five minute mark. So you can also see that none of the animals made it to the 10 minute mark without the Reboa being placed. So there was no difference in our baseline hemodynamics and you, again, we've got the great improvement at the 10 minute mark uh, with the Reboa animals. Now in regards to blood loss, we, what we expected to see was that blood loss would actually be less with the Reboa, but it, in fact we found the opposite, that it was actually the same. However, uh, the blood, that doesn't control for survival time. So when we control for survival time, what we found is that the Reboa animals bled at a significantly lower rate because they lived longer, uh, with an average rate of 14 cc's per minute in the Reboa arm and 198 cc's per minute in the control. And this is really the kind of the crux of the whole of the experiment here. You can see our survival time. So of the, of the five Reboa animals, uh, we'll talk there. So of the control animals, uh, none of the animals made it to the 10 minute mark with an average survival time of, of four minutes. Uh, and in the Reboa arm, four of the five made it to 45 minutes while one uh, reached the hypotensive uh, goal uh, with, uh, at 20 minutes. 
So you can see a significant improvement in survival time. And this is just redemonstrated by our Kaplan-Meier analysis, where you can see none of the control animals making it to 10 minutes. Obviously, we're limited by the fact that this is an animal model, and we're using a small sample size. We only had 10 animals. Uh, we also pre-positioned the Reboa. The, the reason we did that was we didn't want to make this a study about Reboa technique and, and the placement of the balloon, um, because we know that can vary depending on provider comfort with the technology. Uh, we weren't blinded to which arm we were performing, and we did try to mimic an austere environment scenario in which we wouldn't have blood product resuscitation. So in summary, in the setting of massive intra-abdominal venous injury, Reboa was associated with improved survival times, improved hemodynamics, similar blood loss, but a markedly decrease in bleeding rate, and 80% of the study animals made it to the 45-minute endpoint. So in conclusion, to our knowledge, this is the first study to evaluate Reboa in the setting of non-compressible torso hemorrhage from a venous source. Uh, it was effective at preventing cardiovascular collapse and providing a prolonged survival window in which a patient could potentially make it to the operating room. Um, like solid organ and uh, arterial injuries, we saw decreased bleeding and improved hemodynamics with the technology. And we think that Reboa may potentially have an application in a prolonged field care setting as a resuscitation aid. Thank you. Are there any questions from the floor? And I'll remind our discussants, please uh, stand at one of the mics, identify yourself, and keep your points short, sweet, and to the point. Major Yulon, Tripler. Uh, is there any data to support like medics or people who would be in these austere environments putting in femoral anal lines or a Reboa device? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. No, there's not currently data, but that's the ultimate goal by looking at this. And we're trying to get everyone comfortable enough with it at a provider level, that way potentially it could be given to an 18 Delta or a you know, Special Operations Forces medic in the deployed setting who's not going to have access to air evacuation over, you know, within an hour or so. There's no data yet, but that's hopefully where we're moving. There is some data, and I, I just presented some stuff uh, teaching IDMTs about putting in Reboas. Again, it's femoral access is really the key. So in the Journal of Special Operations Medicine, there's, there's some things with rangers and whatnot and uh, taking them so through some of this class. Everything's still is femoral arterial access that we're still working on methods on how, how to actually do that, do that safely, ultrasound, things like that. And obviously with the Reboa catheters getting smaller and not having that huge Amplatz wire that he showed on that first uh, yeah. slide, it's, it's a little bit more reasonable maybe, but there, there's still a long way to go. Okay, thank you. I have one question. So. How do you think this translates to the patient with the uh, exsanguinating pelvic fracture with the, with the venous injuries? Yeah, so I, I think this is a, it's a great technology for that. Um, I would say that, you know, there is some data now saying it can be used for the patient that's actually arresting just recently. Um, that's kind of coming out. But I think the, the goal is to put, this, it, to put it in peri-arrest. And I think that patient is a great patient where you could establish a, a femoral arterial line. And then if they continue to go south, they're not responding to resuscitation. This is, that's the perfect patient for this. In that setting, if you're convinced it's due to a pelvic fracture, you wouldn't have to put it in zone one of the aorta. You could put it in zone three below the renals um, and prevent all that ischemia from, from uh, cross, supercelliac cross climb. I have one other question. You, you did have a PA catheter in this. Did you notice any different cardiac parameters? I, maybe have you done this with arterial and solid organ as well? Yeah. No, we haven't done it with arterial okay, and solid just, organ injuries. I just didn't yet. know if you found any different cardiac parameters because obviously blowing the balloon up at zone one is a huge afterload to the heart. And just like cross clamping the aorta, you want to get it off as soon as possible. Yeah, that's, we have the data. It's something I would have to go back and look at. Um, I can tell you that this was kind of early on in the process when we were doing this, and we did have some difficulties floating the swans in the pigs. So not all of the animals uniformly had them, so it would be hard to compare. Um, but that is something we could look at. All right, very good. Thank you.